So as you can see here, sorry about writing down my positions, I am one of the directors of this um, International Academy of Astronautics, IAA. So director for Scientific Space Exploration. The IAA is based in Paris. There are, there are about 1,400 members. You are elected through peer review. So you have to publish papers, write books, organize conferences, which I'm unfortunately still doing nowadays by, by attitude, you know. And finally, you are elected. Now, just to give you an idea and to encourage the young people, I got elected at the age of 49. Oh, no. And so I said, these people are crazy, you know. I'm so old, I can do nothing at 49. Well, I was wrong, because the average age is 65. So, don't worry if you are not elected when you are young. Please keep working hard. Don't lose your faith. Even if they don't like your papers, whatever, your books or whatever, keep working harder. And sooner or later you might be elected. Okay? So this is an encouragement that I wanted to transmit to the younger generation. Very quick introduction to the topic that I am describing. History. Not by chance, because we are in a big historical conference here. And incidentally, my approach to any scientific problem that I came across in my life was through a good historical prospect of what happened in the past. If you pick up history, then you get the clear ideas because you get the sequence of evolving ideas, right? So history, celestial mechanics. Now, today, it is not called celestial mechanics anymore. It is called astrodynamics. But this was only after the Second World War, when the Space Age arrived. Before the Second World War, in about two centuries in between, when Newton established the field and uh, the Second World War, it used to be called celestial mechanics. Or if you let me, in French, la mécanique céleste, because the most important contributors in those 200 years, surprisingly or not, were mostly French people. So, from 1750 through 1950, roughly, I have to start with Joseph Louis Lagrange. I have a special liking for him because he was born in, in my town. And my town is Torino, or Turin, as it was called at that time. It was at that time, 1735, basically a French speaking town. Now, of course, it is an Italian town, but it's at the political shifts, you know, that occur in big history or just history. As you please. So he was a great mathematician, and even a greater mathematician in some regards was the. the I am I am using the German pronunciation. I hope nobody minds. Leonard Euler. Why Euler? Because he he was born in Basel, and Basel is at the frontier between Switzerland, German-speaking uh, Switzerland, and French-speaking Switzerland. So of course he was pro profitable in both languages but his real language was basically German. So these two gentlemen were excellent mathematicians. And what did they do? They, please notice this, they didn't have any idea at all about space flight. Okay? They were just in love with mathematics. And in that period that they mentioned, they tried to find exact solutions, exact mathematical solutions, to the restricted two body problems. That is, you have two masses. One big mass, here is the Earth. The smaller mass is the Moon. The smaller mass orbits around the big mass just to, to make it easy on a circular path. And then the question is, in that plane, in the plane of the orbit of the smaller here, around the bigger, are there points such that the gravitational pull on that point towards the, moon, the Earth, the gravitational pull towards the Moon, plus the centrifugal force due to the movement of the smaller mass around it, the big mass, so there are three, three forces in the game. So the vector sum of this thing is zero. 
So that is the way to put it mathematically, as the two guys did. And if you work out the equation, which I did, because I want to understand the real thing, not just the words, honestly, you find an equation as a solving equation, an algebraic equation of the fifth degree. Now, there is a theorem called uh, the theorem of D'Alembert, one more French guy of that time, just before the revolution, stating that if you have an algebraic equation of degree n, in the complex plane, there are exactly n roots of this equation. So this is an algebraic equation of degree 5, which means that you have five points. This is what today we call the Lagrangian points. And actually the points are three on the line correct, uh, connecting the two masses. So you have uh, L1 in between the two masses, but, but uh, closer to the moon than to the Earth because of the masses ratios. Then you have L2 above the smaller mass that is above the moon. You have L3 on the other side of the orbit on the other side, uh, at the intersection of the moon or between the, with the Earth. And then you have two more points that in mathematics are called the triangular points, L4 and L5, because they are at the vertexes of two e equilateral triangles. Okay? So these are the five Lagrangian points. And you must know about that, otherwise you don't understand what the hell the, the, the space guys are talking about. Good, so they were discovered by 1700. But again, the two authors that discovered them didn't have the least idea about space one. And since we have it in a big history conference, let me tell you that this situation lasted until 1906. Oh my, more than a century wasted by every human to understand that these things apply to movement of satellites around the, the, the two masses, okay? <coughs> Sorry, I got the call because when the tension passes beyond the threshold, I get for me. Now, this theorem applies to every couple of, of big masses, but then it applies also to the Sun and the Earth, of course. So, you have five more Lagrangian points, in addition to those that they mentioned earlier, in between the Sun and the Earth. So, the big center thing is the Sun with the light, then you have the Earth, and then you have the Moon revolving around the Earth. So, in conclusion, if you keep into account the further two points of the Earth-Moon system, in conclusion, in the vicinity of the Earth, you have seven points. The five Earth Moon plus the two closest, uh, I'm sorry, the five, the, the five uh, Sun Earth plus the two closest Earth Moon. Okay? This is the situation. And there are, of course, space missions. But that was realized much later, after 1950. Lisa Jules one more French guy. I don't know why the French were so right at the time, but ask the French. Okay? So this as you was another French guy living at the time of uh, Napoleon III of the Second Empire. Actually, he did not really compute the what today are called the Lissajou orbit. But anyway, by this name, today, we call the set of orbits as described here that First, uh, you depart from Earth, then you go around for, for as many turns as you wish around the Earth, then you fly by the Moon, the, the Moon gives you a further push, the swing by, and then you keep going on the other side until you get to this region around L2, which is where you want to stay. Stay once, forever. Now, this forever is not really correct because you can prove that while the three collinear points, L1, L2, and L3, are gravitationally unstable, 
that is, if you put a satellite over there, it will finally fall either on this side or on that side. The two other points, the, the points, the triangular point discovered by Lagrange, are gravitationally stable, which is why in the United States, the L5 Society was created by Jerry O'Neill of Princeton University to set up, when possible, a space station, gravitational standpoint that is staying there forever, now forever is correct, in the future. <coughs> so far about celestial mechanics. But then the situation changed. Of course, the electromagnetic waves were discovered, they were exploited, especially for space missions. So, as early, early with respect to today, as early as 1974, the International Telecommunication Union, which is the worldwide body of scientists, engineers, technicians, and also politicians, because at that level it's unavoidable, they have to decide for the benefit of humankind which frequencies can be used for telecommunications and which cannot. For instance, you heard many speakers in this conference telling that in safety we work on the hydrogen line. The hydrogen line is in the so-called L-band, that is 1.420 whatever gigahertz. That is protected, meaning that if you are a rich guy and you want to set up a radio station, you cannot do that legally, because this has to be reserved for scientists, not just for safety, for scientists, whatever they do. So, as early as 1974, the International Telecommunication Union decided to protect the moon far side. Protect how? Protect it legally. So once again, we go from science to legal aspect, which means extending the, the discussions, as to say, much, much more. So this is the recommendation. I cut short on this. But I want to get you the key point in the story. Please look at this thing. On the left, you have the round circle, which is the Earth. This is the solid circle. Now, please suppose that around the Earth there is a telecommunication satellite, that is, those satellites that pick up radio waves from one direction and send them into another direction. There are a number of such satellites nowadays. You know, for instance, just to keep the telecommunication between the uh, Europe and America, there are a number of geostationary satellites. Okay? Then, please expand a cone that starts from that dot dot orbit tangent to the moon and beyond up to a point when the, the, the radii conver uh, converge. Okay? Suppose that the height above the Earth is 100,000 kilometers. This, of course, is arbitrary. You could ask for more, you could ask for less. But according to what you, dis according to what you decide, the, the quiet call, and I told you already the key word, on the far side becomes smaller or larger. Quiet in the sense that whatever garbage telecommunication we produce with that thing around the Earth, the, the telecommunication will not reach that part of space because they are blocked by the sphere of the moon. Okay? So this is the key point in the story. And this was clearly pointed out as early as 1974 by the International Telecommunication Union. If you like politics, it is located in Geneva. Obviously because of the Society of Nations. Okay, back, back thing. Incidentally, I owe these slides to Dr. Jill Pragnell Tata, Tata, the goddess of safety. You know, Jill Tata has been for 50 years the dominant lady in the city business. And she is the person that gave me these slides. Okay, so this is the article S22 in the telecommunication business, and I, I am not going to. Next. 
we arrived to the uh, 1994. Now, this gentleman here is the, was the French radio astronomer Jean, in French is called Edmond. So the French called him Monsieur Edmond. But in German, of course, it's Heidmann. It's, you know, the, like oil, uh, oil, uh, as you please. Anyway, I met him. He had the chair in astrophysics at Medon Observatory, which is the big observatory in Paris. And uh, may I say so, I became a pupil of his. Actually, it was him who transmitted to me the need to explore SETI more. So if I ever set this scientist, don't, don't blame me only, blame Jean Heidmann also, right? So, he convinced me that we should have done something already at that time, at least in the 90s, to preserve the quiet region of the far side, quiet in the sense of rather quiet, of course, of the far side, and also the space above it, which is the quiet calm. Okay? Now, at that time, I have to be frank, nobody cared at all about that. Why? Because nobody had any money to put into a space mission to place over there satellite. So the space agencies were not interested. Now here is just as a sort of timeline describing what happened. I have just to say very frankly that in 1998 he called me up and said, look, I have to appoint a deputy to myself. He was the head of the committee of the IAEA studying this problem. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be my deputy? And you know, honestly, I, I, I was an am, a naive person, so I said, what should I do? And he was such a great man, he said, oh, you do nothing, I do everything. <laughs> and that was it. Now, <clears throat> I always regret this episode because I was so naive not to understand that he had cancer. And in less than a year's time, he passed away. So Haipan Dani died in the year 2000, July the 3rd, at a hospital in Paris. And then the academy called me and said, well, hey, you are the deputy, would you like to continue this work? Oh my. Well, in the end I said yes, but it was not an easy decision because I had no expertise. So once again, I, I am saying so. To help the young people, don't be scared. You'll get the expertise. You know, but keep going. So there was a first paper in Artesonautica, which is the journal of the academy. I I don't want to say more about the quiet con, forget about that, this is too much fun. But here the, the great event in my life arrived. First of all, I have to be frank. The IAEA, in the person of the General Secretary, the French, Jean-Michel Contant, called me up in the year two, uh, two point, two ten, sorry. So, you know, ten years had elapsed since his death to this event. And he said, Contar said, look, we have to make this issue clear at the higher level than just scientists. Scientists are excellent people. They know everything. You know, they, 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 they devote their life to science, but here the problem is much, much different. This is a political problem. A political problem at the worldwide level. So why don't you go to the United Nations and make a speech about this, an official speech that is archived at the United Nations archive. So please, if you put my name, Marconi, at the United Nations, you will pick up the presentation that they made on June 10, 2010, at the United Nations. Now, you say, United Nations, where? Well, the popular feeling is, of course, that the United Nations are in New York. Well, let's be precise. In New York, for the, the bad things, the wars, conflicts, politics, whatever. But then there are other branches in other parts. <coughs> and the one that I was interested in is Indiana. So what did I say on that occasion? Well, <clears throat> I claim that 
if you want to say at least the central part of the Versailles, which obviously is the most protected, the most shielded part from radio garbage made by human and, and coming around the earth, we have to say a, a circle. And this circle is, is in between two parallel lines, plus 30 degrees and minus 30 degrees. And the reason why I selected that, this is the moon as seen from above, is because if you look at the moon as seen from above, you have the two Lagrangian point at 405, making an angle of 60 degrees with the earth moon line. And so in conclusion, that circle will always be free from radio garbage made by humans in the centuries to come, because it is at the center of the facade, even if there will be space stations, as Jerry O'Neill said, at the two triangular point of order. So that was my act. More, I suggested one crater, the site, Daedalus crater, which is located practically at the center of the facade. So you see where, where it is, just at opposite the earth. So at the end I pole. And this I selected because in the future if you want to put up a radio telescope, or as the, the engineers prefer to say, a phased array, but it's the, it's the same thing. Inside this thing, it's a huge crater, 80 kilometers in diameter. And it has a high rim, 3 kilometers, which is excellent because <clears throat> the radiation coming from space and hitting the surface of the moon cannot go inside the crater. So if you put the radio telescope inside the crater, it will be pretty safe from noise, not only from the Earth, but also from space. And then it is so big that we could do even interferometry. And physicists know that if you do interferometry, you have the best possible way of coping with angular resolution. Attenuation. What is the attenuation? The duration is how much weaker the signals coming from Earth are if you place a telescope over there. And these are the values in dBs. Let me just point out that dB is a logarithmic equation. So when we talk about minus 30 degrees, it means that the intensity is 10 to the minus 42. Okay? More, this is for, for, for practical practically important frequencies in uh, astrophysics. But then the politics arrives. Uh, that's the bad thing. And so the moon rush is a, yes, thing. the moon rush is in between China, USA, Russia, Japan, India, Europe, and possibly America. Now what is the situation now? The other situation is that there is the Chinese relay satellite located at the Lagrangian point and two above the far side because the Chinese plan to land on the far side for the first time. No one else has ever done that. So if we want, we, the Westerns, let me put it that, if we want to go to the far side, either we put up one more relay satellite at the Lagrangian point or at two, or we deal with the Chinese in negotiation so that they allow us to do, to do what we want. Politics, I, I won't say more. Let me just tell you something because the time, time is short. At the same point, near the, 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 the big relay center, is an instrument that Professor Mike Garrett, sitting down with the last row, probably knows a lot more than I because he was probably at the time the director of Astro in the Netherlands. But the basic idea is that, to cut short, if you do cosmology, then it, there is a sort of radiation that was emitted about 400,000 uh, years after the Big Bang. <coughs> and of course the universe expanded for 14 billion years or 13 whatever, and so the intensity is extremely low. So if you build up, a thing like this, that there are three leaves essentially, and you put it where the Chinese thing is, then you may hope, hope to detect this radiation, confirming many cosmological things. Okay, I cut short. So, the principal investigator for this thing was Simon Politics. I ran a conference in Paris on 
March 27. And there were important political people. The Chinese delegation was made by 20 people. So clearly the Chinese want to deal. It's the Western that don't know what to do. The European administration would like to negotiate. The Americans, please forgive me, don't know what they are doing. Because they are waiting for the new president, who will appoint a new NASA administrator. So, okay, who knows? Conclusion. What I am afraid about are the private entrepreneurs. They have the money. And if you have the money in America, you can do anything you please. Whatever government is in power. So this is what scares me. Because they, they don't say it that way, but essentially this is the message. We have the money and pollute as we please. So they could destroy all the silence on the far side and above the far side just because they have the money. Okay? So this is a scientist that is helping me. Negotiations are urgent. If you are in Washington, D.C. on the 19th of October, please join the new meeting that they are organizing as a part of the International Astronomical Congress on October the 19th, and please support this cause of saving the far side before it gets too late. Thank you very much.